Hello and welcome to another tutorial video. As you can see, we're going to go back into real estate today and talk about the loan to value or LTV ratio, which is a super important concept there. So for all the files and resources, you'll want to go to this link on screen, go to our knowledge base, real estate modeling, and then loan to value LTV. I'll put a link to this below the video and pin it there as the first comment. So you can just click on it. This is another excerpt from our real estate modeling course for individual properties, which is now available separately from the real estate investment trust training. So here's the short version of the loan to value ratio. Once we finish this in a few minutes, as always, then I'll go into more detail on each of the points here. So the loan to value ratio is the debt that is used to acquire a property or refinance an existing loan as a percentage of the property's market value at the time. So if the property is worth $100 million, that's what it costs you to buy the property, and you're going to use $70 million of debt to acquire it, the LTV is just 70% here, the 70 million of debt divided by the $100 million property value. Now in real estate, the LTV is typically a key driver because it determines the debt and equity used to fund the deal and the potential returns in the deal as well. Like all leverage, the LTV amplifies returns in the deal. So if a deal does well, a higher LTV will make the equity return go up to an even higher level. And if a deal does poorly, a higher LTV will make it even worse and will make you lose even more money. So just as a simple example, let's pull up our simple real estate pro forma that we use as an example throughout these tutorials. And here we're using a 50% LTV for the senior loan and a 10% LTV for the mezzanine in the deal. And the way it works is that we list the $25 million acquisition price. We have some fees and also replacement reserves here. And then on the other side, we base the senior debt on the 50% times the $25 million acquisition price. We base the mezzanine on the 10% times that price. And then the equity accounts for the remainder. So we're literally just taking the total uses in the deal, subtracting the debt used, and then we're splitting it up between two different groups of equity investors. But fundamentally, the LTV determines both the debt used and then the equity required, which is just the total uses minus the debt used. Real estate tends to use far more leverage than normal companies. So you will see LTVs of 50%, 60%, 70%, even 80% or higher because of the stability and predictability of the cash flows in many properties, the relatively high margins and cash flow yields, and the fact that the amortization periods for the debt are often much longer than the debt's maturity itself. In an acquisition model, as I just showed you, the LTV drives the required investor equity. In refinancing, the LTV determines the new debt that is used to replace the old debt, which should be higher. And that means that the equity investors get some bonus cash flow earlier before the exit actually takes place. So if we pull up another example here from a hotel acquisition, renovation, and refinancing, initially the hotel's acquisition price is about $54 million. And we use altogether an 85% LTV to make the acquisition. But then when we refinance the loan, the property is now worth 70 or $71 million and we refinance at a 75% LTV. So essentially we take out a permanent loan upon the refinancing that is worth almost as much as the initial acquisition price paid to acquire the property. What this means is that when the exit takes place, yes, we get some exit proceeds from that. But before that, in year four, when we refinance, we get a lot more than what we repay from the acquisition loans here being refinanced, and that creates a bonus cash flow for us in year four before the exit officially takes place. So that is the very short version of the LTV. Let's now go into some of these points here in more detail. I'll start with how to find the right LTV, then we'll go through the acquisition example, we'll look at the refinancing example, we will discuss why high LTVs work in real estate and why properties can support so much leverage. And I'll go through an Excel example here. And then we'll talk about the LTV versus the debt to equity ratio and the debt to total capital ratio for normal companies. Let's start with the first point, how to find the right LTV. The short answer here is that the LTV in deals is almost always based on recent comparable deals in your area. So you can often look up brokerage or mortgage lending reports on recent property deals in your region, and it should be pretty easy to find for major cities. I'm gonna pull up an example here for Miami multifamily loans that were made as of this year. And you can see the LTVs on these loans and also the interest rates for different loan sizes. Interest rates tend to be lower on larger loans and higher on smaller loans, interestingly, but you can see the LTV here is up to 80%. And you can usually find these types of reports for major cities. One thing to note, though, is that 
you can't necessarily just assume that you can use an LTV of 80% because you still need to test the numbers, see if they work, and see if the property actually has enough cash flow to pay for its debt service at that 80% LTV. And if it doesn't have enough cash flow, you're going to have to reduce it to some lower number. Let's go through the acquisition example now in a bit more detail. So here, as I showed you previously, we're acquiring a $25 million property. It has a 50% LTV for the senior debt and a 10% LTV for the mezzanine. I showed you how to calculate the equity earlier. We essentially back into it by taking the purchase price, subtracting the debt used, and then adding the fees and other expenses. When the LTV is lower, that means the upfront equity is higher, but the cash flows to equity also go up and there's less debt repayment upon exit. When the LTV is higher, it means there is less upfront equity, but there are worse cash flows to equity and there will be more debt repayment upon exit. If it is a good deal, then a higher LTV should help you and it should be a win since it amplifies returns. So let's go back to this model and just look at how this impacts things. So right now, if we add up the total equity used, it is about 10.5 million. And if we just reduce the LTV here, so let's say we take it from the 60% that's being used right now down to 40%. Let's also look at the returns before we do this. So right now we get an equity IRR of about 20% from the deal at a multiple of 2.3x. You can also see the cash flows down here, which tend to be quite positive through this holding period and the initial equity investment down here of the 10.5 million. Now, if I go up and I change this and I say that our senior loan LTV will now only be 40% and we won't use any mezzanine at all, so it'll be 0%. Our upfront equity goes up significantly. It's now around 15 million. And let's go down and see what type of impact this makes on the model. So now our cash flows to the equity investors are definitely higher. Before they were around 600 or $700,000 per year, something like that. Now in many of these years, they're well over a million. We also repay less debt at the end, but we contribute more equity up front. And as a direct result, the IRR goes down by about three percentage points. The cash on cash multiple also goes down from 2.3x to 2x. Now, of course, if this deal performed poorly, if we got a negative IRR or something else very low, then using additional leverage here would hurt us rather than help us. In the refinancing example, usually the motivation here is to increase the equity returns because the property's value should increase over time if it is being managed well. Typically, you will fund the initial deal with some type of specific loan to cost ratio. Loan to cost is similar to loan to value, but for property developments instead. You might do this at a ratio of 70 or 80%, and then you'll refinance it in a few years when the property becomes worth more by that time. In this example, which I showed you before, we use an 85% LTV for the acquisition and a 75% LTV for the refinancing. And you might look at this and think, how could this possibly work? Because we're using 85%, which is more leverage initially, and then we're using less leverage when the refinancing takes place. How does that make any sense? And the very short answer is that since the property's value increases substantially in this time, the math here can still work. Now, in a refinancing scenario like this, the property's value is typically based on the forward net operating income. So the 6.3 or 6.4 million here divided by the appropriate cap rate, which we covered in a separate tutorial. Cap rates are essentially the reciprocal of valuation multiples and they're used primarily for properties like this one. That's the short answer. As long as the property's value increases substantially, the refinancing can still work even if the LTV drops in the process. If we disable this refinancing altogether, Let's go up and change the switch and say that we're not gonna refinance the acquisition loan in the mezzanine here. The IRR would now drop from around 19% to about 18%. Maybe not a huge difference, but every little bit helps. And if we refinanced earlier or we use the same amount of leverage, the same LTV, we'd probably see even more of an impact here. The last topic I wanna to cover is why such high leverage can work in general in real estate. And I think there are three main reasons here. First of all, properties tend to have very high margins, such as over 50%. If you look at the NOI margin, the net operating income divided by the rental income, they tend to have high yields, such as five to 10%. If you look at the NOI divided by the purchase price, they also tend to have fairly predictable and stable rental income streams because many of the leases are multiple years. Now there are exceptions here. If you look at something like hotels or multifamily properties, a hotel isn't really in this category because it's all short-term multifamily properties tend to have just year-long leases, so they're not really the same as an office property with a five-year lease for a company, for example. 
Another factor is that the loan amortization periods are often much longer than the actual debt maturities. So you could have a loan that lasts for 10 years, but it amortizes over 30 years. And then the last point is that you could have special terms such as interest only periods. So let's go and take a quick look at this. I have a very simple file here. We're acquiring a property for 10 million. The going in cap rate is 7%. So let's get our year one NOI like that. For the equity contribution, let's start by taking the property value and multiplying by the LTV to get the debt funding. And then the equity contribution will just be the property value minus the debt funding. For all these numbers, let's start by linking in our equity contribution for the purchase or sale of property in this column. And then for the NOI, we'll link to our year one number right here. We have capital costs, so capital expenditures that we need to maintain the property. We'll link to this. And both of these are going to grow at the 3% rate that is stated right here. Let's take this and copy it down. Now for the interest payments, we need to track the debt balance. So let's link up to our debt funding right here. And then the remaining balance each year will equal the old balance, and then we'll subtract the debt principal amortization, and then the repayment of the debt upon exit. So let's just copy this over. And for the interest payments, let's take our remaining debt balance right here and multiply by the 5% interest rate. For the debt principal amortization, let's take the starting number right here, and then we'll divide by the amortization period of 30 years. For the repay remaining debt upon exit, this will just be zero in most of these years, and we'll assume a year five exit. We'll link it to the remaining debt balance, and then we'll subtract anything that is amortized this year. So let's take all of these and just copy them across. For the purchase or sale of property, it will be zero in most of these periods until we get to the very final year. For this year, for year six, we are going to take the net operating income in year six, divide by the exit cap rate of 8%, and that gets us our selling proceeds for the property. Also, I made a mistake here and I forgot to flip the sign. So let's do that. And now we have that. And if you look at the debt service coverage ratio based on net operating income, it is above 1x. So we can easily afford this. Now we're cutting it a little bit close in some of these years. We don't have a whole lot of cash flow left, but we can definitely afford it because the total debt service is less than our cash flow available. Now, if we change this and made it a 10 year amortization period, now we run into issues because now our cash flow is not sufficient to service this debt our debt service exceeds the cash flow available. And this is why the amortization periods on these types of commercial real estate loans are often so long because the leverage is high. So the amortization period needs to be long if you want the math to work. One last step I wanna discuss is the LTV versus the debt to equity ratio and the debt to total capital ratio. The debt to equity ratio is just a company's debt divided by equity. And this is normally the book value of equity on their balance sheet. The loan to value ratio is more like the debt divided by the debt plus equity. For a normal company, this is more like the debt to total capital ratio. And so they're measuring different things. That's the first major difference here. If we just look at the loan to value versus debt to equity ratio. Another difference is that the debt to equity ratio is often based on the book value of equity rather than the market value. So you're not looking at a company's market cap. You're looking at strictly its balance sheet especially when you're doing credit analysis. But in real estate, you don't really use this. You really only care about the market value of the property at the time of the purchase or the sale or the refinancing. Another difference is that for normal companies, the debt to equity ratio is more of a guiding metric or the output of analysis. It's not really a key driver. No one would use the debt to equity ratio to determine the debt used in a leveraged buyout, for example. But you would use the LTV and you do use the LTV all, to, all the time to determine the debt used to fund a real estate acquisition. So those are some of the differences between these closely related but still quite different metrics. That's about it. So let's do a quick recap and summary how to find the right LTV, you can usually look this up, find recent deals in your area, look at mortgage or brokerage reports, and you can usually find some estimates there. For the acquisition example, we went through it. I showed you how to back into the equity required based on the LTV and also what happens if we use a higher or lower LTV. Then we did the same thing for the refinancing and you saw how even if we reduce the LTV, we can still get a positive effect and still get a bonus to the cash flows there as long as the property's value increases substantially over the time frame. Why do high LTVs work in real estate? It's because of the 
relatively high margins and yields, the stability and predictability of the cash flows, and the fact that the amortization periods are often longer than the debt maturity itself. Also, sometimes there are special terms like interest-only periods that make it even cheaper in the beginning to service the debt. And then finally, we talked about some of the differences between the LTV and the debt to equity and debt to total capital ratios. The bottom line is that they're all measuring somewhat different things. They're used differently, and the LTV is a key driver in real estate, whereas these two really aren't key drivers. They're more like metrics that you look at or outputs that you look at in analysis when judging a company and its financing options, but not necessarily something that you use to drive the amount of debt and equity in a model. That's about it for this lesson. Hopefully now you should know a little bit more about the very important loan to value ratio in real estate and how you might use it in financial models.